Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this episode, we touch one of the most irrelevant cities in California. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well. Oh, and one last thing. I have an announcement to make, so please listen up. Recently, some YouTubers decided to reveal my identity. Well, it was really Adam22 who kicked off the rumors, but it's simply not true. I don't know who he is, and I definitely don't want him to be falsely accused of being Mr. Swamp. So instead, I'm going to just reveal who I am, plain and simple. This was a long and difficult decision, but it needed to be done. Since July 2nd, 2021, the people have been curious. The world simply deserves an answer on who Swamp Stories truly is. <sighs> So here we go. My name is Okay, I'm kidding. I won't tell you who I am just yet, but I'll at least tell you where I'm from as a hint. Everyone seems to think I'm from the suburbs, but I'm not. I'm actually from the city of Anyways, to start off the video, I'm going to pick up where I left off in the Fresno video. And if you don't remember, I described the drive from San Francisco down to Fresno and all of the obstacles it entails. Essentially, you go from absurd wealth and beauty in the Bay Area, and as soon as you get farther and farther away, you pretty much enter a new state. A state that is nothing like the California of the movies. It's dry, extremely hot, and most importantly, it's filled with people that you didn't think could even exist. You'll end up seeing face tattoos cats on leashes, and fools wearing true religion in DC skate shoes in 2022. And for those of you who think I'm exaggerating, I've made this drive numerous times and the things I see still are not normalized in my brain. The bottom line is that the Central Valley is very poor. In fact, three of the five most impoverished areas in the country are in the Central Valley. California does in fact hold the richest and poorest areas in the country simultaneously. People may wonder why the Central Valley is this way and why it has has so many issues. In all honesty, it's just a matter of geography. It's not an ideal place to live. Unless you're in the agricultural industry, there is nothing there for you. You can't go to the beach, there are no hills or hiking trails, and most importantly, it tends to smell like cow poop. Well, we're not here to talk about the entire Central Valley. I've covered Stockton and Fresno before and told you guys how awful those places can be. But what if I told you that there was a place much, much worse? I'm talking about a Stockton on steroids, a place you should never go to. Welcome to Bakersfield, California. Once you enter Kern County, you feel like you're in Texas. You'll see massive trucks, cowboy boots, and political flags that you never thought you would see in California. In fact, in 2020, it was one of the state's only red counties. So in order to understand this unusual city, let's head back to the start. Back in the 1900s, Bakersfield had a population of just 2,000 people. But in the 1930s, it established a sizable railroad stop which increased the population to 25,000 people. Yes, you heard that correctly. Bakersfield was originally a railroad stop. That's it. However, in the 1960s, they discovered oil and that's when the population started to grow. It attracted a lot of blue collar workers from the south. So by 1990, Bakersfield had reached a population of 175,000. But by this time, the oil industry slowed down completely and the city was left in a weird place. There was no industry left in the city of Bakersfield and jobs were pretty much limited to basic necessities. So usually under these circumstances, a city would decline in population. But for Bakersfield, their population grew faster than any other city in the state. In fact, the city grew by 65% in just 10 years. And this was essentially two groups of people. Immigrants finding work in agriculture and residents of LA who were escaping the madness of South Central. The 1980s and 90s in LA were so awful that families began leaving by any means. Everyone knows that many people went to San Bernardino, Palmdale, and Moreno Valley. But everyone seems to forget about about the tens of thousands of people who moved two hours north to Bakersfield. At the time, Bakersfield was seen as an up-and-coming city where real estate was cheap and there was a safe environment for families. But that reputation quickly started to change. Los Angeles began bringing their affiliations with them to Bakersfield and here's how it played out. At first, it was a giant free-for-all with people representing all kinds of different things. There were Main Street, Hoover's, Treetops, and the list goes on. So because of this, Bakersfield in the 1980s and 90s was completely chaotic. And over those years, the neighborhoods began forming their own identities. 
the previously middle-class suburban neighborhoods were starting to transform into South Central. By 1990, there were three major sets in Bakersfield. First, you have the East Side Crips, located east of Union Ave. These guys distinguish themselves by wearing Kansas City Royals gear, and this represents their main block which is Kincaid Street. Then next you have the West Side Crips, located just across Union Ave. And despite their close proximity, these guys are complete rivals. That leaves us with one last set. Let me introduce you to the Country Boy Crips. These guys are located just south of the east side across Brundage Lane. They're known for wearing powder blue instead of dark blue. And although historically they've been much smaller than the others, they're equally as wild. So let's get into it. Since the very start, the west side and Country Boys have been close allies. And that left the east to fend for themselves. So the 1990s and 2000s consisted of the Country Boys and west side versus the east. However, after numerous indictments everything seemed to calm down for quite some years but just like anywhere else things seemed to go in cycles this story starts off in 2013 when the east side kicked everything off or so they thought at this time the country boys were the largest they had ever been bakersfield pd estimates that there were 400 to 500 of them just in this small neighborhood but out of everyone no one stood out more than these four members Devonte pink jimmy baker trevante williams and lastly Charles Bell, also known as C-Mac. And this is the original C-Mac, not the clown from 55th Street. Excuse me. <clears throat> 55th Street! January 27th, 2013. C-Mac decides to head over to his cousin's house for a barbecue in the east side. He knows that there's always an inherent risk, but he assumes that he's okay because he's been out of that life for quite some years. However, when he arrives, a man in black is right there waiting for him. This was a huge loss for the country boys and they were understandably furious. This was the first incident in a long time and C-Mac at this point was a great father to his son. In fact, his son was well on his way to making it D1 in football. Well, after this, everyone assumed that it was the East Side who did it. The entire time, the East was denying any involvement, but the country boys didn't believe it. So in 2013, the country boys had their eyes set on anyone from the East Side. They simply didn't care who, when, where, and how. And in this case, they had their eyes set on an East Sider named Floyd Bean. This is who they thought was responsible for what happened to C-Mac. February 6, 2013, the country boys drive over to Roy's Market. This is a known east side hangout spot, and right there on the corner they spot Floyd. <laughs> Thankfully everything was okay, but just four days later they would be back. February 10th, 2013, Devontae Pink and Jimmy Baker drive down to Roy's Market once again, and when they arrive, Floyd Beam is hanging out right outside. <laughs> This incident shocked the east side because they knew very well that he had nothing to do with C-Max passing, and to them this seemed over the top and unnecessary. At this point the entire Bakersfield is confused. The east side won't admit to doing anything which is extremely uncharacteristic. So the country boy's eyes started pointing in their own direction, and for whatever reason the person responsible started to feel it, and coincidentally that same week he would go down for having a BAM machine in his possession. This would be a country boy named Devonte Garrett, and what he would do next would go down as one of the wildest things I have ever covered. After going down for the simple charge, he was paranoid that they would tie him to what happened to C-Mac, so he decided that his best option was to get ahead of it. He called Bakersfield Detective Croker and told him everything the country boys had been doing except for what he had done. So in return for his charges to be dropped, he told them that Devonte Pink and Jimmy Baker were responsible for Floyd Beam. So after this, the two men got life and Devonte Garrett walked free. That's even though he allegedly caused the entire mess in the first place. But despite the truth coming out, the damage was already done and the country boys in East Side were back at odds like the 1990s. And that takes us to 2014. This is the year where a rapper named Claxta began being recognized for his music. He released music videos on YouTube wearing his powder blue and representing his side. But Bakersfield would quickly find out that it wasn't just music. 
November 7th, 2014. Bakersfield is a small city and there really aren't that many places for people to go to. And on this Friday night, both sides coincidentally went to the same club. At 10.30 p.m., Claxta and his friend Donnell Robinson pull into the parking lot. There, they see a red infinity with a familiar face next to it. That would be an east sider named Lionel McGee. So once they make eye contact, the two men approach each other. And when they get face to face, Claxton makes a wild decision. Bam. After this, he drives away and would later be caught. In court, he tried to prove that he wasn't a part of the Country Boys, but his music videos proved otherwise. So in 2016, he received 65 to life. And for whatever reason, after this, the Country Boys kept getting bigger and bigger. That's partly because so many LA residents began moving up to Bakersfield. However, the next story has nothing to do with Bakersfield or even California. In 2015, the country boy leaders started sending their guys out to North Dakota. Yes, you heard that correctly. They had over 15 members move to Minot, North Dakota. So I guess this is where Flacco gets his street cred from. Anyways, this is where they laid low and got their money. At first, the members were not happy. To go from Bakersfield's blazing heat to North Dakota's freezing cold weather was not easy. But their dedication to the organization organization is what kept them going. And after this method was successfully working, they started doing it more. In 2016, they sent 20 members to Portland, Oregon to establish there as well. And eventually, the country boys had a presence in six states. Not only did they do this to make money, but it was also a way to duck investigations. They didn't expect California to care about the guys in North Dakota, but unfortunately for them, that was not the case. The entire time, the FBI was watching them and picking up on clues. Operation Deep South. On December 17th, 2019, 35 country boys went down all across the country. But despite the takedown, the country boys were still big in Bakersfield. In fact, 2020 was Bakersfield's worst year of all time. I'm sure many people at home will laugh at the notion of Bakersfield being hard and that's fine. I'm not saying it's Chicago or Oakland, but it's also not San Diego. Kern County was officially California's most dangerous county in 2020 and 2020. 2021, and the vast majority of it surrounds these two sides. So let me break it down. The east side is represented by a rapper named B.O.B. Keda. He's actually pretty good and you can tell he's influenced by Northern California. He almost sounds like a poor man's E.B.K. Young Jock. And also on the east side you have a rapper named Baby Coke. Interestingly enough, both of these rappers make songs with Mozzie members. They even mention their love for HGM in their songs as well. I don't know how this came together so if anyone knows please let me know in the comments. And on the other side you have country boy rappers like S4007, and he also raps over NorCal beats as well. So I guess we can consider Bakersfield as Northern California now, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding, time to get your own swag, please. I need to start being nicer, but these two groups have been going at it and that's the bottom line. August 15th, 2020, an Eastsider named Willie Christie is leaving the Northridge Apartments at 3 p.m. This is right in the middle of Eastside territory, but that's when a car pulls up. <laughs> After this, rapper Baby Coke would make a music video dedicated to his good friend. And not too long after, the East Side would get back. This time it was their youngest member, Daquante Cage, also known as Infant Weeze. November 18th, 2020, 9 p.m. Two teenagers from the Country Boy area are at a gas station on Fairfax Road. Well, that's when an OG from the East Side notifies Infant Weeze of where they are. So instantly he gets in his car and drives across town. And when he arrives, they're still there. Quickly after, he would go down, and what would happen next would upset everyone. Due to California's Law 1391, he only received 9 years for this, and he will be out before the age of 25 with a clean record. Many locals in Bakersfield were upset about how lenient the ruling was, but again, consider that Bakersfield leans a different way than the rest of the state. What do you guys think? Is this enough time or are the locals right? Well, after this, the east side wasn't done just yet. This here may be the wildest story so far. May 5th, 2022. 
three East Side members decide to head to the Valley Plaza Mall, even though they're not supposed to be there. That's because two of the men, Tavion Wandick and Denil King, happen to be on ankle monitors. Either way, they're so bored that they head to the mall anyways. And as they're entering the mall, they spot Daniel Williams, a known country boy associate. He happens to be ordering at the Wetzel Pretzel, so he's not paying attention. So the East Side men go back to their cars and wait on him to leave the mall. 15 minutes later, Daniel walks into the parking lot and hops in his Chevy Camaro. He then heads up Highway 58, so the East Siders start following him. About 3 miles up Highway 58, they finally catch up to him. Bam. 20 days later, the three teens went down after their ankle monitor locations were discovered. And right now, they're all facing life. This rivalry is completely out of hand and there are dozens and dozens of more stories that I didn't include. So hopefully everything can calm back down like it once did. But that's gonna do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and are glad you know who I am. So if you did, remember to give the video a like and subscribe if you're new. Peace!